And your recording started? Yep. We're You're on. good? Okay. Thank you. And my screen is being shared in Zoom land? Yes, yes, you're good. Sweet, okay. Yeah, that's Zoom land. I, that's, the Zoomers live in Zoom land. So um, that's what I call it, it's Zoom land. So I'm always like, oh, Zoom land, so. All right, well, um, I tend to think of this as kind of piecing our history together. And I feel like it is a gigantic jigsaw puzzle. And I'm not sure that I have all the pieces in place just yet, but we'll, um, we'll see where we go. So this is the Lathrop House in Sylvania. If you have not been there, um, it does open up on Sundays in, um, starting in May. Um, from one to four, if you want to stop by and see the Lathrop House. But the Lathrop House was um, constructed in 1835 by Elkaniah Briggs. And then um, Lucian Lathrop moved into um, the area at about that same time, actually. But he settled a little further west um, in Richfield Township. And then he married his second wife, Larissa. Titus Lathrop, and they moved into the home about 1850. So the um, home was constructed in kind of two phases. So it was a um, frame upright and a wing home that was constructed by Elkaniah Briggs. And then before um, Lucian and Larissa moved into the home, they built um, this portion that you see here. So it was, um, that is where they, they lived and they resided there until um, Lucian's death in 1873. And oral histories throughout Northwest Ohio tell us all about different places that were stops on the Underground Railroad. And the oral history for the Lathrop House is that the slaves, the enslaved people, would travel along the different routes and they would come into Sylvania. And um, we have documentation that they would get to the Haroon farm and then come across property through the ravine into an outside entrance into the basement of the Lathrop home. And they would hide behind the stove. So this is the stove here. They would actually, this side of the stove, the oral histories, is that this would not be in use. And so they would actually, the enslaved people would actually crawl into the stove and there was a door in the back that they could drop down into a secret room. And oral histories um, say that the um, room was discovered during a remodeling project in the 1930s and that beds were still located in the room. So that sounds really awesome, really cool. And the story sometimes just ends there, but the story is really so much bigger, especially when we're talking about the Underground Railroad, but it's scattered and piecemealed like a puzzle because the Underground Railroad was this secret network that helped enslaved people travel from one safe spot to the next safe spot. And we've gr all grown up hearing about these stories of the Underground Railroad. There were stations, there were station masters, there were passengers, there were cargo, and there were conductors, right? Sounds simple, right? Mm, it is, I promise you, not that simple. <laughs> it is not that simple. It sounds very organized and logical, but when we dig into the resources, when we dig into the written record, what I have found is that actually one station master may only know the next station master. After that, they had no clue what direction the enslaved people traveled. Oftentimes they never heard if those enslaved people actually made it to freedom or not. Um, also, we think house people, enslaved people, 
very simple. But it was a whole network of people that supported the Underground Railroad. So we have found in cities across the country that there were vigilance committees, which were people in there going about their everyday lives that would help share word that enslaved people had perhaps come in to the town and were looking for a place to stay, perhaps share word that a slave catcher was in quick pursuit or that somebody was looking for somebody. There were common everyday people, just like you and I, who saw that somebody was in need. So you took three pairs of mittens over to your neighbor's house. You didn't really ask what those extra three pairs of mittens were for, or maybe why they needed 10 extra shirts or extra food or extra salt pork, but you took it because they were in need. And so maybe you didn't really ask. So the Underground Railroad was really not quite as secret as we always think it was. This network of people knew each other and knew each other very well and had to have a lot of different resources to be able to do the job that they needed to do to help these enslaved people reach freedom. So the story starts with just Lucian and Larissa at the Lathrop House. But in Northwest Ohio, it's so much bigger than that because they could not have accomplished it just by themselves. It took an entire network of people. Now, my joke is, as I've started researching this, and my husband's probably rolling his eyes in Zoom land right now, is that what I need to find is Lucian's Facebook page, but what I keep finding are just his tweets. So you really have to dig through these sources and look for how were these people connected? How were they communicating? Because Mr. Haroon did not just show up on Mr. Lathrop's porch and say, here you go. Can you help me break federal law? I have three people that I would like to hide in your basement. Mm -hmm. That didn't really happen, right? There had to have been a network, maybe church, maybe masons, maybe their farmlands touch. We know their farmlands touch each other, but their farmlands had to touch each other. How did they receive word from, we know Mr. Haroon, um, frequently worked with a station master in Maumee. So how did he receive word from that station master in Maumee? We know that um, enslaved people, if they were in Toledo, sometimes they traveled from Toledo to Sylvania in order to elude the slave catchers. Sometimes they went from Sylvania to Toledo to elude the slave catchers. And so the, that whole process is so much more complicated than what we think and more connected than what I ever remember from fourth grade history class. So of course this becomes important um, contextually in the large scale of things with federal law. So we have the 1793 Fugitive Slave Law. And so it was always against the law to help enslaved people escape slavery or escape their bondage. The 1793 Fugitive Slave Law, local governments could seize and return enslaved people. Penalties were given to those who offered aid. And it was determined in 1793 with the Constitution that states could abolish slavery, but that they were obligated to respect the state laws of other states. So Ohio did not have slavery, but we were obligated to respect the fact that Kentucky did. Now, this was not heavily enforced. So there was a lot of loopholes here. And we do know that the Underground Railroad starts to develop very early. 
And we have documentation that it starts with Native communities, Natives helping um, enslaved people. We have documentation that it starts very early with Quaker communities um, as they take a stance to help against enslaved people. And we have historians very early in the 19th century, the 18th, um, like 1850s, 1860s, right after the Civil War, as we start collecting these really heightening the fact that this was secret. And this is really a great quote that captures that from John Parker. The strategies resorted to the ambushes sprung and the actual hand-to-hand -hand conflicts between individuals and groups will never be told for the simple reason that the men who knew dare not tell what they knew. And historians in the 1850s and 1860s really say, well, we can't document that this person was involved in the Underground Railroad because it was illegal. So they didn't keep records or they didn't write down the list of names of people that they helped. And it certainly gives us this impression as well that it was more organized than what we had thought. But what we're starting to find with more recent scholarship since the early 2000s is that the Underground Railroad really wasn't as organized as we thought. There really wasn't clearly defined routes. And oftentimes routes changed very quickly, depending upon the situation that these enslaved people were facing, perhaps how many people were traveling, um, how close was the slave catcher, um, where they wanted to go even oftentimes dictated the routes that they traveled. Um, we have learned that codes and tunnels and stations were not necessarily um, clearly defined, but that there was an interlocking network that helped everybody work together to accomplish these goals. So some of them in Ohio and some of our more famous spots are the Reverend John Rankin's home in Ripley, Ohio. And this is on the National Historic Register. This is a um, site for the Ohio Historical Connection. Um, he was one of the first stops um, when slaves crossed the Ohio River. Uh, they would climb uh, these stairs here from the banks of the river. They would climb up these high steps here to his home. Uh, his story as well, his involvement in the Underground Railroad is also well documented in Harriet Beecher Stowe's um, book, Uncle Tom's Cabin. We know from this as well, we have uh, John Parker's home. John Parker was a freedman. He was one of the first African-Americans in the nation to receive patents for his inventions throughout the 19th century. And he also helped to um, hide um, enslaved people and is well known as a conductor. Other rather famous conductors on the Underground Railroad are of course, Harriet Tubman, this young woman here, and then also Laura Haviland. Now, Laura Haviland is a Quaker woman from Adrian, Michigan, and she um, was very passionate about helping um, freed people or helping um, enslaved people escape. She traveled frequently down to Cincinnati. She would, was very involved with um, John Parker. She was very involved with um, Reverend Rankin. She even a couple of times went even down into Kentucky and further down into the southern states um, to help escort people up into um, Cincinnati. At one point in time, she there was a fine on her head, um, but she dared to walk down the streets of a southern town and her attitude was, well, they don't know what I look like, so let them have good luck catching me as she walked down the street. She was feisty. Um, but these are famous people. These are the wows of history, these are the ones that make the history books. And these are the individuals that wrote down their stories. They have diaries that were able to go and read. Um, Harriet Tubman traveled the country for the rest of her life, talking about uh, what she did to help people. Um, 
Laura Haviland as well. She wrote an autobiography, carefully documenting her involvement in the Underground Railroad. She continued to work with the Freedmen's Bureau after um, the Civil War. So their stories are well documented, but they're the famous people. They're the famous people. How many of you donate clothes to Goodwill? Maybe donate socks to Hannah Socks. Drop off food at your local food bank. How many of you put that on your Twitter feed or your Facebook feed or in your diaries and letters? Not very many, right? So the Underground Railroad is so much more than just these famous people. It's, so, it's these everyday people that are way harder to prove in history that they were involved, but yet people that that really risked their themselves to help. So some of our local areas or local stops in um, the area, and I just kind of picked uh, a few. There's so many more. I'm sure you will tell me more spots as well. But we do know that the House of Four Pillars was a stop on the Underground Railroad. Um, it sits right on the banks of the Maumee River in Maumee, Ohio. Um, the um, enslaved people were able to ford the river right there across the river, especially um, in the summertime when it's low. And they would come into the house through um, tunnels into the basement and find refuge there. We also know um, the Mommy Color Company was a stop on the Underground Railroad. Ladies, the great quilt foundry there, right? If you're a quilter, um, <laughs> the quilt foundry in Mommy today. Um, it was a stop on the Underground Railroad and they would um, um, hide or find refuge up in the second floor. And we also know the Mesa Winslow um, House and Blacksmith Shop was a stop on the Underground Railroad. This is located at um, 315 Cass Street. It's still the, um, this building still stands and you can still, last time I was past it, you could still see Pock and Broom Company on the bricks. It's very overgrown right now. Last time I was past it, it still has, I think a bunch of ivy over the building and things like that. It's over by Side Cut Metro Park if you've ever been over that way. He also served as a stop on the Underground Railroad. And from his stop, he documents that if there was no close pursuit, fugitives were either uh, were brought either to Toledo or taken via Detroit Avenue to Monroe, Michigan, and thence across into Canada. If pursuers were close, they were taken to the Sylvania stations. And with the Sylvania stations, the Haroon family documents in their family recollections that David Haroon would go to um, Amesla Winslow's foundry with a false bottom wagon, hay wagon. And the enslaved people would hide in the false bottom of the wagon and he would fill it up with hay or whatever goods or whatnot, and then drive it on up into Sylvania. And then they would hide either in the attic of the home or in the hayloft of the barn. And his family documents that. And then his grand, his great granddaughter mentions that sometimes they would go across the ravine and hide at the Lathrop home. So our puzzle starts to get a little put together here. But I still feel that's still too simple. <laughs> that's not enough. He couldn't have only worked with, we couldn't have just the Haroons or just the Lathrops. There had to have been more people involved in Sylvania. Um, and we find nuggets as I continue to do research throughout that talk about the Sylvania stops. And so they, they, these nuggets tend to show that they were part and parcel of a greater network in Northwest Ohio. So some great research was done or has been done by um, Naoma Twining on the King Farm right here. And I'll show a picture in a little bit of the King Farm, but the King Farm. And through her research, she documents that all of these red stops here were stops on the Underground Railroad. 
as they are coming in from Indiana. Frequently, we have documentation that um, enslaved people would follow the towpath because they traveled frequently at night and the towpath offered a nice clear spot, oftentimes um, with trees, and so they were not very visible, and not a lot of people were using the towpath, so we, we know that that was a great path for enslaved people to travel. But we do have an oral history from Genevieve Eicher, um, and she is actually a descendant of Tar, and she documents that her grandparents took her around and drove her to these different stops that they documented were stops on the Underground Railroad of people that they worked with on the Underground Railroad. And so she remembers traveling from Defiance to Florida and talks about the enslaved people finding refuge at the Newell House or with Dr. Patterson here in Florida. And then from there, they would travel up to the Eckert Farm and the King Farm and the Iker farm. And then from there, they would travel further north to the Weeks farm or Dresden Howard's farm or the trading post at Winnemug, and then on into Michigan. And you can see here's where Laura Haviland's um, stop was at the at River Raisin Institute. Um, they also talk about this trunk right here. I've read the Adams Ridge line, which is this pink path that follows a native um, path. Um, and the agent from the Adams Ridge line would transport them up to the King or the Iker farm. And then depending on where they wanted to go or where the um, enslaved people wanted to cross um, or where they wanted to settle, they could go north or they would sometimes travel the West Delta line into Sylvania, into Sylvania here, into Monroe, or into Toledo before finding their way to Canada. Now, what I find interesting about that is Mr. Haroon, or I'm sorry, Mr. Lathrop living here in Sylvania was a Universalist minister over here in Lyons, Ohio. And he preached in Lyons for about 10 years. So I'm kind of curious as to when that puzzle piece will fall into place, because I just feel like it's going to, but I don't have the answer just yet, but I think it will. So I do think that these Sylvania stops, the Haroons and the Lathrops were more involved than just with the mommy stops as well. So I do have some pictures I don't have. Um, this is a picture of the Congregational Church in Ridgeville, Ohio, which you saw was identified as a, as a stop on the Underground Railroad by um, Genevieve Eicher. And then also here is the um, King Farm. Um, and we know that they it was a stop here. Now, Reverend William King was a minister that settled here in Ohio. He actually inherited 15 slaves from, um, I believe, from his wife's family. And when he inherited them, he didn't quite know what to do with him, them, but he did want to give them their freedom. So he um, took these 15 slaves, gave them their freedom, and then escorted them into Canada and helped them to set up um, the town of Elgin in Canada. So there is an Elgin settlement in Canada that was set up by Reverend King and these 15 um, enslaved people that he inherited lived out their lives in Canada. And that became a terminus on the Underground Railroad. So many um, other enslaved people found their way to that town. So the routes for the Underground Railroad as we like to say, we, we try to understand these routes. You can see this is a map from um, Siebert, Wilbur Siebert, and as he collected oral histories in the 1890s. And so it starts to show where all of these stops were and perhaps how they were connected. And Ohio was a very active state on the Underground Railroad. And we do know that two to three lines of the Underground Railroad terminated in Toledo. 
or they would come all kind of come together in Toledo before um, the enslaved people would find their way into Canada. Now, Canada. Why do I keep saying Canada? <laughs> So in seven, with the 1793 Fugitive Slave Law, while um, Ohio was a free state and did not have slavery, we did have to recognize that Kentucky did have slavery. There were fines that could be imposed for not returning property, but it was pretty, it was very loose. This really wasn't enforced. And so oftentimes Ohio was interpreted as kind of a terminus of the Underground Railroad because enslaved people could come and they could settle here in Ohio or settle um, in any of the states that um, were slowly getting rid of um, Slave, slavery and live out their lives. Because if they were um, arrested, they would go to court and they would have to have proof of identity. They would have to show proof that they had previously been owned and it could go through the court process and possibly even be overturned. But as tensions continue to rise between the North and the South, and we start to get into the larger debate of the expansion of the institution of slavery west of the Mississippi River. This becomes a very political issue within the United States. And one of our last compromises is the Compromise of 1850. And part one, it's five parts, but the one part I'm going to focus on tonight is the 1850 Fugitive Slave Law. That was one part of this compromise. Now the 18 Fugitive Slave Law, 1850 Fugitive Slave Law really tightened down that 1793 Fugitive Slave Law. So the 1850 Fugitive Slave Law required states to return the enslaved people, required them to return the unfortunately property that had escaped. It was the federal government's responsibility to return the enslaved people. So the federal government under the 1850 Fugitive Slave Law would appoint U.S. commissioners. And the U.S. commissioner would issue a certificate for removal. It did not go to court. There was no evidence of identity. No longer was there evidence of ownership, for lack of a better word. The commissioner simply issued a certificate for removal. The marshals and police officers then had full authority to remove that individual without any evidence of identification, any proof of ownership. Civil and criminal punishments could be filed against anybody who helped or hindered that, um, helped the enslaved people or hindered that process. And under the 1850 Fugitive Slave Law, there was absolutely no protection for freedmen from kidnapping because there was no proof of identification that needed to be made. Now, a U.S. commissioner was paid $5 for every certificate of removal that was issued and paid $2 for anybody that he did not return to slavery. So this really escalated the need for the Underground Railroad because people who had been living in Ohio, living their lives, sending their children to school, working, could now be captured and sent back into slavery. Or if they had never been enslaved in the first part, place, captured and sent into slavery for the first time ever. Now, it's important to remember that in Ohio, we are not perfect or innocent. We did have black laws in Ohio. We were one of the first states to pass them in 1803. So there were restrictions for how African-Americans could live in Ohio. They had to have somebody who um, would go to court for them and put up a fee for them for good behavior, vouch for their good behavior. They had to carry with them at all times their manumission papers proving that they were free. They were treated as 
second and third class citizens. They didn't vote. They To send their children to school, they had to have permission of all the other families in the area to send their children to an integrated school. So we are by no means innocent, but this certainly escalated the need for the Underground Railroad. And we see a tremendous increase in activity on the Underground Railroad from 1850 until 1860 with the start of the Civil War. And so Toledo became very active, very active port in um, as a, this terminus on the Underground Railroad. And I should have put a different map here. I should have put another map here. But anyways, so Toledo becomes a very active port and we have the docks here at Toledo. And so we ha had slaves coming in. Um, Toledo as a transportation hub was very important on the Underground Railroad. We had um, enslaved people coming in um, by foot, by wagon, they use the trains and they use the ships as well to travel in and out of Toledo. And so Toledo was this tremendously active area. So some of what I learned in this research connecting it to the Great Lakes is that um, made, um, enslaved people would come to Toledo and if slave catchers were not in quick pursuit, the fastest, safest way was to board a ship and take that ship to the next port or take that ship right across to Canada. And so that was really eye-opening to me as well, or a lesson I learned is because I oftentimes thought of these ships just kind of leaving Toledo and going straight over to Canada. That was not always the case. Sometimes they would come from Sandusky to Toledo to Detroit, or sometimes Toledo to Buffalo, um, and then on into Canada, or sometimes from Toledo to Sandusky to Detroit, it, they would just travel. So it was a vertical as well as horizontal movement, east and west, north and south. But moving was important because that's what kept the slave catchers moving as well. So as long as you're moving, you could do that. So I did find some um, documentation of different, what was called abolition boats. So the Mayflower was an abolition boat. The, oops, I clicked too fast, I think. Yep, sorry about that. We have to work with the technology here. The United States was an abolition boat. Um, and the Niagara was an abolition boat. And so what abolition boats were are boats where the captain was helping enslaved people, where the captain was willing to take the risk to hide the enslaved person on the ship and transport them to the next port or transport them into Canada. The um, next one is, or I'm sorry, here, actually I have, I'll go back here, sorry about this. The Niagara, I had it confused with the Sultana. The Niagara actually was captained by General Charles Reed and Charles Reed um, hired only African-American workers for his ships. And so on the Niagara, he employed William Wells Brown and William Wells Brown was a freed African-American who worked as a conductor on the Underground Railroad helping to um, helping enslaved people to move from Cleveland to Buffalo to Detroit. And then what the Niagara would do is be, um, they would just dock conveniently at Amherstburg, unload their cargo, and then go on into Detroit. And so by docking just a little further south at Amherstburg on the Canadian side, their cargo was able to unload. Um, and I should probably stress, I forgot to mention that Canada proved to be so important of a terminus because of international law. Canada, um, the England had abolished slavery in the 1830s. So when they reached Canada, Canada was not required to return enslaved people to the United States. Now, what I thought was so interesting about the book club 
I read, I participated, the Great, um, Great Lakes National Great Lakes Museum is doing a book club and I read the book for this month, which was um, Dawn of Detroit. And what I found was so interesting was that before um, Canada abolished slavery, their enslaved people would cross the Detroit River to find freedom in Detroit as freed people because the United States would not return people to Canada. And so I thought that was very interesting. Um, and so it was a great, they could live in freedom even though, um, again, even though we had black, black laws and codes in place, but uh, I thought that was very interesting. So we also have the Sultana, um, which was an abolition boat. And then we have the Arrow as well, which was an abolition boat. Now the arrow is interesting because it traveled from Sandusky to um, sometimes straight across into Canada, but Sandusky to Detroit as well. And the captain of the arrow actually was brave enough to hide um, enslaved people on board while their slave captors were actually on board as well. And he refused to turn over the enslaved people to his slave to the slave catchers. And he was charged, it was 1852, 1853, so right after the passage of the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act, and they pressed charges against him. And he was charged under the um, 1850 Fugitive Slave Act. And he was fined, at the time, $3,033.34. The $33.34 was for court fees. The people of Sandusky raised the $33.34 and paid that, but the captain had to pay his own fine of $3,000 for violating the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. So I think that was uh, very brave. <laughs> so Ohio's network. So here is this map of Ohio's network and you can see paths coming up from Cincinnati, paths coming up from Ripley, Ohio. We have documentation that they would travel through Finley, Bowling Green, Perrysburg, Maumee, Sylvania, Monroe. We um, chatted a little bit about these um, Western paths here, looking at Maumee from um, coming in from Indiana along the canal and the towpath on into Sylvania to Toledo to Monroe. And then of course, as I said, my lesson that I learned for this research is looking at, at the lake here as well. So you can see they would travel east and west along the lake as well as north and south in this effort to find the best place where they were able to live their lives in freedom. And so now, the puzzle's coming together just a little bit more. I will admit there's still, I still have questions <laughs> as to how this puzzle is going to fit together. But I think understanding that network and understanding how all of these stories fit together in the larger picture of the Underground Railroad and that quest for freedom is only going to help us to understand that complexity of the past and, the, and how, yes, People did brave things like the captain of the arrow, or we had our famous people like Laura Haviland or Harriet Tubman. But at the same point in time, it could have been just a common person like Lucian or Larissa helping those in need that were passing through their area when they needed to help them. So I will pause. Here's a couple of my sources because I know people like to, to see those, but I can answer any questions, or I'll try my best to answer any questions. I got a couple over here. Okay. Um, first of all, Robert mentioned, and I think he's sort of questioning, not questioning, but wondering, as you were talking about slaves from Canada coming in, the same Detroit book that you referenced kind of talked a lot about slavery, Black and Indian people in Detroit from the 1700s onwards. So mm -hmm. is there a specific time frame that you're talking about when they're crossing back towards us? So that book focused on the 1790s to the um, war, of 1812. So she kind of ended about 1815. I would 
based off of her scholarship, I would say it's probably safe to assume that slaves were crossing from Canada into the United States, seeking their freedom up until um, England abolished slavery, which is about 1832, 1834, somewhere around there. Um, so I would think that that went that way. Now, enslaved people, re oh, for us, constantly crossed into Canada. That was oftentimes a terminus of the Underground Railroad. But I have found in my research that that really became important to cross into Canada after the passage of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. So that really became very vital. Um, and this book, Eric Foner, he focuses on the Underground Railroad in New York City. And his research has shown that even um, enslaved people who had settled in New York City and had been there for 15 or 20 years after the passage of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 no longer felt safe and relocated to Canada at that point in time. So I think that um, we're looking, we see our slaves, um, our enslaved people crossing into Canada from the 1700s and through the Civil War when um, we abolished slavery, I think is a safe guess there. Uh, all right, I, I got some more over here. Um, and the, so Janet, this is a quick reminder. Can you repeat? Oh, right, I'm sorry. No, it's just so the people on Zoom can hear what I'm saying. Um, uh, Sandra had uh, two questions about some of the stuff crossing, if, if you know the answer. Uh, so he was asking about conductors possibly on a Niagara, maybe with the last name of Wade or Wells. Oh, yes. So um, Sandra asked about conductors on the Niagara with the last name of Wells or Wade. I do not have the last name of Wells. The conductor that I have that's named on the Niagara is William Wells Brown. Um, and then she was also asking about on that last map that you have that travel east, the east of Cleveland straight north to, into Ontario. Mm -hmm. I would have, I would assume that would just be, you know, more steamboats, but. Um, I found that um, I, I didn't look specifically as far east as Canada. So the question was asked what like um, types of boats, I guess. Um, I did not look as far east as far east as Canada. Sorry, as far east as Cleveland. Um, I looked Sandusky, Toledo, kind of Detroit. I kind of stayed at our end of the lake. Um, but what I found from Sandusky and Toledo was any ship that could make the trip they used. So it, from Sandusky, they talk about using um, sailboats, small fishing boats. Um, we have that documentation of the steamers. Um, yeah, in the summer of 1853, there's a story of four fugitive slaves that arrived in Sandusky and boarded the Sharpie, which was a fishing boat, and paid the Captain Swigels $35 to take the group to Canada. The party set out at 8 p.m., so they even crossed the lake at night, and by the morning they had reached um, Point Opili, so that was one story that I found of using a fishing boat to leave Sandusky. Actually, from Toledo, Senator James Ashley is actually from Toledo, um, and he's the author of the 14th Amendment. And there is a story, I couldn't find all the details. There is a story of him taking um, enslaved people across Lake Erie in a sleigh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when it was frozen. Yeah, he took them. Yeah, when it was frozen. Um, yeah, so I couldn't find the details. Like, I couldn't find, like, when that happened or anything more than that. But it was just, like, this one little, like I said, this one little puzzle piece that's there. And it's, like, there's this cool story in that somehow. But I haven't found all the answers yet. So literally, any way they could cross the, cross the lake. Right, I, and just to, again, if anybody here has a question, please raise your hand. I'll go. go ahead. <laughs> That's so amazing. The Lighthouse House. Were there any instances or any other houses in the area, the station, where uh, the kidnappers, the slave people, were trying to find the slaves? They actually knocked on the door and they went through any stories like that. I have not found any um, at 
the houses. I did find an account. Um, I, it was 1849, 1852 um, in Toledo where a um, slave catcher had escorted an enslaved person um, from Adrian into Toledo and had put him in a boarding house um, in Toledo. And some people kept him busy while the African-American community got the enslaved person out of that boarding house. And before the slave catcher realized it, he had been ushered away. There's also the story at the Oliver house, um, Laura Haviland, um, she had a family living on her property in Adrian, Michigan, and they were a freed family. And the slave owner wanted them to, um, wanted to, to, to capture them back and take them back into slavery. And um, he had tried, this was in the 1840s, so he had tried to do it legally. Um, he had tried to get the judge to recognize his ownership over this family and um, take them back into slavery. And the judge would not recognize it. There was always a reason for the judge to not recognize it. So then this slave owner faked an illness and he was so sick and he couldn't travel. He had made it to Toledo and he was staying in the Oliver house and he was on his deathbed and he so desperately wanted to see these two individuals that had been with him his entire life. And he wanted to see them one more time before he died. And could they please travel to Toledo to see him. And um, this sounded rather fishy to Laura Haviland. She, she was not quite on board with this. So she worked out a scheme and she came to Toledo with another gentleman disguised as the um, desired person and a, and a, and a, um, and then I think, and one other gentleman, I think her son, I think her son, and they came to the Oliver house. They traveled to the Oliver house and the um, African-American went up to the sick room in the Oliver house and it, it took so long. And uh, Miss Haviland got very nervous because it was taking so long to identify him. And finally she forced her way up there. She managed to get her way into the room and um, determined that this was all a ruse just to capture these people and take them back into slavery. And so they left very quickly. They stayed overnight at a different boarding house and then they boarded on the Erie Kalamazoo Railroad that, and um, the slave catchers were able to stop the Erie Kalamazoo Railroad just before it had pulled into the station in Sylvania to search, but there were 40 people who had caught word that this was going to happen from Sylvania that came out and helped to protect those on the, on the train um, and help to keep the train kind of moving and pushing its way through. Um, and they thwarted the, the slave conductor and she was able to take these people back up into um, Adrian, Michigan and keep them close to home. So there's a story there. I, I don't have all of those details, but there is a story there that I'm more curious about. So those are the two examples that I have found of like kind of like really close. Um, and then I did find that there were some race riots in 1862 in Sylvania, actually with the stevedores. Um, the stevedores went on strike and the company hired African-American stevedores, which is not odd. Um, and they loaded a boat in the, um, in the port and the striking stevedores said that would be the last boat that would leave Toledo. And so um, a, 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 a riot started. Um, two people were stoned, an arm was broken and a person's head was um, broken. And then the mob violence took to the streets and they marched down the street, Monroe Street, and they came to an African-American woman's home just on the canal and they destroyed the, the home and threw it into the canal. 
And then um, the priest at St. Francis de Sales at the time tried to disperse the crowd, tried to, you know, calm everything. And the crowd would not listen. So they marched down the street and they were, I believe, on Erie Street, heading towards the home of William Merritt, who was an African-American barber who lived in Toledo and a very successful barber that lived in Toledo. And the priest at St. Francis de Sales was able to discourage them from destroying his home and his property. Um, and, the, and the mob violence just kind of walked the streets and kind of attacked people as far as the Blade article said. Um, and then when the sun went down, it just kind of died away. Um, so I have that tension in 1862. Um, th so those are the three examples I have found kind of close in Toledo of tensions rising between the groups or, yeah. So I'm sorry, that prompted, did you have a question, a comment? Well, I was gonna bring up, I, I don't remember the whole story, but the Pennsylvania story with the captured slaves on the train and there was a whole group of Pennsylvania people that were dismantling the tracks, I believe. Something like they, yeah, there was, they were doing something and, right, exactly, yes, yeah, to keep them from, from capturing, but it was, it was like 40 people from Sylvania um, that, that was able to help Laura Haviland and these people kind of evade the slave catchers, so there's a, there's a, there's a puzzle piece that needs to get put into place on that story for sure. So any other questions, Zoom land? I got, I got one more from Earl who was just wondering um, how were the slaves able to pay fares to cross Lake Erie? Oh, great question, Earl. So how could slaves pay fares to cross Lake Erie? Um, there are a couple different ways. One, um, this, there was the, what do I wanna call it? Um, I was gonna call it putting out, but that could confuse it with the actual putting out system. Um, so plantation owners could, could rent out their slaves, uh, especially if they were skilled, like a blacksmith or a cooper or something like that. And they would be paid money for doing their work. And sometimes, um, at least definitely early in the 1820s and 1830s, um, slaves were allowed to keep a portion of that money and so they would save that for their um shipment or for their escape i should say um that's how henry box brown was able to mail himself in a box up to i think it was new york or boston he mailed he put himself in a box and mailed himself um uh, yes a couple different times he ended up upside down yes um i think three times in the journey he ended up upside down. Um, a couple other people tried that and were unsuccessful, but yes. Yeah, so that's how they were able to pay. They were able to pay through um, the vigilance committees would also raise funds and help to pay for um, ex fees like that, but also that included court fees as well. So the vigilance committees would raise, raise funds as well for that to pay for things like that. So, um, or the, the, um, conductor or the station master or whatever, whoever was helping you would pay those fees as well. So. All right, let's go. I got one more. Yes. Let's see you guys do that and then we'll call it a night. And I thought maybe you can, if you wanted to, you can talk a little bit about Heritage Sylvania, but Thomas was wondering if you could briefly explain about the moving of Lathrop House and how the church and the city's role in voting for the funds, et cetera. Okay. <laughs> um. Yeah. Three minutes. Oh my goodness. No, no, no. Oh, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Um, okay, so Thomas asked, and Kathy and Roger, you might have to help me. Um, I did not bring all of those notes with me, and it, that is a complicated story in and of itself as well. Um, so Maria Boat was the last owner of the Lathrop home, and she passed away. And uh, the did she? St. Joe's bought the house from the estate for, for more parking, for more parking and their community center, correct? And um, that caused um, many citizens in Sylvania to become concerned because they had grown up 
um, hearing the stories of the Underground Railroad and touring the home and because she would take school children through the home and tell them the stories of the Underground Railroad. And so many people became concerned at the possible demolition of the Lathrop House. And this became a very um, passionate topic in Sylvania. And um, the what ended up happening was um, Metro Parks stepped in and um, preserved the house, but not in its original location. So the house has been moved um, 500 feet, something. East. Yeah, east. Just a just hop, skip, and a jump east of its original location. So it is still on the ravine, um, which is important to the interpretation of the home. And Metro Parks um, decided recently um, that it was best fit with Heritage Sylvania. And so now um, Heritage Sylvania um, owns, operates, and interprets the Lathrop House. So. Um, I hope that answers all of the questions for for that. Do we have any other Zoom land questions? No, I think we're out of Zoom land questions. Any other questions from you fine folks? Um, how did you um, take an interest in this project? Hmm. Um, I think it's just a matter of time. Um, well, every project has its origin stories, I suppose. So um, I actually worked for the Metro Parks a long time ago when this started. And um, I always kind of had questions to be very honest about the Lathrop House. I was always kind of like, hmm, there's a lot of holes in this project. Um, and so it's always been kind of an interest in mine on the back burner to, to learn a little bit more and understand a little bit more. So um, as I worked through my PhD at the University of Toledo, um, I went to a um, presentation there by Dr. Judith Wellman, and she was kind of one of the first um, historians that I had heard talk about the fact that the Underground Railroad really wasn't as much of a secret as we had always thought it to be. That what we really needed to look at to understand the Underground Railroad was the connections between people. You know, how many times did um, Clarissa Haroon go and visit Larissa Lathrop? And how, what, how many times did those, you know, did a mysterious basket show up on her front porch with supplies in it? Um, and, and Judith Wellman really started to introduce that and, and it was a workshop with her to look at kind of, to look at some sources to understand this, right? So one of the red flags to me was always that Lathrop was a Democrat. I was like, mm. um, but, but I just found that yes, he was a Democrat, but the Democrats in Lucas County in 1840 adopted the same platform as the Free Soil Democrats in 1849, I'm sorry, I said 1840, but 1849 adopted the same platform as the Free Soil um, Democrats. So mm -hmm. they actually took a very public stance against the institution of slavery and the continual spread west of the institution of slavery. So I found that to be very interesting. It's kind of a connection. Um, and Lathrop was, um, I, I'm curious about his role as a universalist minister. I'd like to learn more about that with his connection with the church. I also would like to learn more about Larissa Lathrop. She's kind of, she's my new um, fun project. So she is a member of the Titus family from New York, and she actually grew up in Brighton, New York, which is a suburb of Rochester. And if you're familiar with your anti-slavery history and the abolitionist movement, um, that is a hotbed of abolition. And Larissa Lathrop came to Ohio, she was about 41. She, she was a Spencer when she married um, Lucian. She was 42 years old. And um, maybe it's just because I'm the same age as she is, but I'm like, you know, I'm pretty stuck in my ways. Like, good luck to my husband for trying to change my mind on something that I've, you know, been raised in and my religion that I practice, you know, preaches and things like that. And um, I find it 
I want to know more about her because she had, she was raised in this abolitionist hot zone and then comes out to Ohio. Um, we have this story that they would have had to cross, you know, the Haroons owned property here, the Lathrop's owned property here. So when you look at a map, there was a farm between them. Want to know who owned that farm? Larissa's sister and brother-in-law. Coincidence? Maybe not. You want to know who owned the farm south of them? Larissa's brother and sister-in-law. Coincidence? Maybe not. Um, they are all Quakers from New York, so I'm really curious to see if there's a relationship there with Laura Haviland and understanding that. Um, so when I started to hear those stories from um, from the Lathrop friends of Lathrop, I thought back to that workshop that Judith that from Judith Wellman, and I it's always just been kind of like a hmm, well what about this and hmm, what about this and you know and so that's how that's how I got interested. I just you know in my spare time this is what I do. <laughs> Any other questions, Frank? Yes. Yes. Later, yeah, for um, Ohio Oberlin, um, Oberlin University or college, sorry, was a strong abolition. And then, of course, we have the Oberlin Wellington rescue case of 1852, where um, in Ohio becomes one of the states to challenge the constitutionality of the um, 1850 Fugitive Slave Law with the Oberlin Wellington rescue case and the story of John Price. So yeah, that was a hotbed of, um, of anti-slavery as well. There was one more over here. Yes, sir. Yeah, I don't know the time frame, but Lucian was also a state representative. Yes, he was. Um, so 1852, so it was like January to March of 1852. And then the next session where he was a US uh, a state representative was um, like 52 to like 53, but it was like January or February of 1853. Um, I, not that I know of, <laughs> not that I know. Of. I'd have to look when Lincoln came through Ohio, but not that I know of. Um, and I haven't explored his, um, record yet at the state legislature. And so I think that's definitely a clue. Right. So I think that's definitely another piece of the puzzle that needs to be researched that may give us another clue to who these people were. Okay, I'll turn it back over. Watch your stuff. Share real quick. Oh, okay. There we go. There you go. There we go. I can see. All right. Thank you so much, Janet. This has been super fantastic. Um, it's I really been enlightening for me, you know, all your research and time and energy that's gone into that. Um, along with Janet's um, presentation here tonight, we're working with Heritage Sylvania to put together a new micro exhibit for inside the museum, which we're hoping we can get up in the next week or two uh, about Lathrop House and the Underground Railroad in this area. So we will let you all know when that goes up. You can come back and, and visit again and see some of the artifacts that uh, they have that, that normally on display in the Lathrop House in the summertime, but not at the moment. Um, our next lecture in the spring lecture series is on March 23rd at 7 p.m. Jerry Dennis, who is the author of The Living Great Lakes, Searching for the Heart and the Inland Seas, will be with us to talk about his book, which is an explore, exploration of everything. Um, here's how did it get described. Uh, the book portrays all the complexities of the Great Lakes through stories told by biologists, fishermen, sailors, and others who Jerry grew to know while traveling aboard the schooner Malabar. Um, I will say Jerry will be virtual on the 23rd, but we will be hosting a watch party here at the museum. So you're welcome to join us here live, or you can join us um, from home. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the Living Great Lakes, Searching for the Heart of the Inland Seas. It's amazing book. Yeah. I read that, and I'm not a water person. <laughs> <laughs> well, excellent. There you go. We have a testimonial right here. For those of you that are involved, for those of you that are involved with um, the, our, our Great Lakes book club, that will actually be the book club discussion the week before. Um, and if those of you that aren't involved in the book club, you uh, should be. 
So how's that for an answer? Apparently they have great books. <laughs> Uh, please don't forget if you uh, aren't a member or you're up for uh, renewal for your memberships, please do so. You can do so at nmgl.org backslash membership. Um, and again, thank you as always for those of you that are with us tonight here and in Zoom land. Um, we have really enjoyed it and we hope everybody has a safe and wonderful rest of the February into March. And here's hoping it doesn't snow anymore. <laughs> All right, have a good night.